Thanks, Mustafa, and thanks everyone for the invitation and for uh, coming to our talk. So, uh, can you all hear me okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so today uh, we're going to split the talk uh, roughly in three parts. So, the way we have structured it is maybe like 20, 22 minutes each. Uh, and like we'll have like five to eight minutes for questions, or you can even take a break if you want to. And uh, I'll present first, and if you have questions, keep uh, uh, we can uh, you can ask in the Slack channel or post it in the Zoom chat, whichever is convenient. And we can uh, in about 20 minutes, I can um, take some of those questions. All right. Um, so today we are going to be talking about uh, uncertainty in deep learning and. Uh, this joint work uh, with lots of awesome colleagues uh, at Google, DeepMind, and uh, elsewhere. So uh, I'll first start off by giving some background on uh, why uncertainty is important and why do we care about this topic. So, so before we uh, get started to the methodology, what do we mean by predictive uncertainty? So to make sure we are on the same page, um, so what we mean uh, is that uh, we want to predict like output distributions rather than point estimates. So imagine you are doing like classification problem, like in the 2D example above, where you have some features x1 and x2, and you have two classes shown in like red and blue, or uh, you are maybe trying to uh, predict some, uh, you're trying to do some regression where you have some feature x, and you are trying to predict some uh, function uh, value y, and uh, typically uh, like you know you. Uh, most people just do train a classifier and gives like a deterministic prediction. Um, and here we don't want deterministic predictions. We want a distribution to capture the uncertainty. So for classification, it could mean that you don't just predict which class it is. You predict the probability with which you believe that that point may be uh, from the class. And for regression, you don't just want to produce a point estimate, but also a sense of the variance um, and, uh, as shown in the figure on the right. So uh, what are the sources of uncertainty? So, uh, in, so there are kind of like a two sources of uncertainty that I'm going to be talking about. So the first source is some inherent noise uh, in, the, uh, in P of Y given X itself. So uh, you can imagine there is some noise in the labeling process. Like for instance, uh, here is an example from the CFAR 10H uh, data set where uh, basically they took like images of from like C5 test set and then they asked multiple raters to rate and here's the distribution. So as you can see, some images are pretty clear, like the human labels may be like super clear, like on the top, it's uh, everybody ag uh, agrees that it's a plane, the second everybody agrees it's a cat, but the, the last two images are inherently pretty ambiguous. So you could imagine it could be a ship or you know, uh, like an animal or something and the last one, uh, since we can't see the head super clearly, depending on like how you look at it, it the texture looks a lot like a deer, but it, it could also be a bird. Like So there could be some human uh, ambiguity in the label. So there could be an in inherent distribution or like labels for a given input rather than just like a deterministic label. And similarly, you can have like this for um, like, you know, measurement noise and why. So imagine you're running some experiments and you're trying to like regress um, like the, the, the kind of like uh, uh, some sort of like function uh, with, with respect to some parameters that could be like uh, if there is inherent randomness in the procedure or some measurement noise, then every time we do the measurement, you may observe a slightly different value so that the, 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 it's not a deterministic y for a given x, but like an entire distribution. And uh, this is uh, sometimes also called, you may see this term, which is called um, aleatoric uncertainty. And the, the, the distinct property between the two types of uncertainty I'm going to be talking about is that this source of uncertainty is usually considered to be irreducible in the sense that even in the limit of infinite data, uh, it's, a, it's considered like uh, to be irreducible. Uh, however, uh, a lot of the, this can be caused by like, you know, partial observability in some sense that if you actually give additional features, you can reduce this. So for imagine if you had like a higher resolution of this image or something like that, where you could see more clearly, you can reduce this uncertainty where you have like, or whatever, if, the, if you give an image of an animal with the, with the head blurred or something like that, if you actually see the head, you can decide like what animal it is, but 
irrespective uh, if you don't have that information it could be ambiguous because of that so the next source of uncertainty is uh, what we call model uncertainty and uh, this uh, basically arises because you have um, this basically arises because you given limited training data you may have like multiple functions uh, which are consistent with the observed training data so an example of this is the figure on right where you see that uh, you have two classes uh, shown in um, squares and triangles and we are trying to do a binary classification problem but as you can see there are multiple possible classifiers which equally well explain the data so uh, given just this limited data we cannot precisely pin down which is the uh, this is the only classifier that separates the data right like so there could be like multiple equally valid uh, explanations uh, which can separate out the two uh, data sets so we are not sure which is the 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 right function yet so maybe if you observe more data then the classifier would be like more constrained and um, in the in the infinite data limit uh, assuming that uh, you have uh, your models are identifiable by that we mean that when you specify the problem there is a unique uh, optimum you don't have like uh, symmetries or something like that which uh, uh, if you so that uh, you can actually identify each model so uh, in in that case as you get like more data this uncertainty reduces so this is also known as uh, epistemic uncertainty and uh, this is considered to be reducible uncertainty unlike the previous slide where the it's uh, uh, the data uncertainty persists even in uh, the infinite data limit, basically. So, um, and how do we, uh, before I jump into like the methods, um, the let's, I think it's useful to discuss how do we measure the quality of uncertainty. So there's a couple of measures that are uh, commonly used and one of the terms um, you will hear a lot is what's called calibration and um, like an intuitive way to think about calibration is that it measures um, how well the models uh, when, when models predict distributions uh, they express uh, their predicted confidence which is basically their own estimate of the probability of correctness so that's how we can think about like the confidence so the models own estimate of the probability of correctness and you, we can check how well it aligns with the reality in the sense uh, you can actually measure the accuracy on the on on a data set and you can see whether in the cases where the model is uh, expects to be correct what fraction it actually is correct and a common way to do this is the following which is uh, i hope you can see my mouse uh, pointer so what people do is in like binary classification imagine you are expressing probabilities in the zero to one range. So people usually bin up these probabilities into like multiple bins. And um, what you can do is for each bin, uh, so in this bin, for instance, the model expects to be correct 90% of the time, like uh, in the 90 to one, uh, 0.9 to one range, um, the model expects to be correct uh, in, on average, like 0.95 times or something like that. You can use the average expected gain for the bin then you can you can take all of the examples that ended up in this bin and you can measure what fraction of those the model is correct so if it is well calibrated on all of these points the model should be correct 90 percent of the time and that's what you plot here so the x-axis shows the the bin the average probability uh, or average model confidence within the bin and the y-axis shows the actual accuracy of the model in that bin and if it's perfectly calibrated all the points should end up on a it should end up on the diagonal line because in this bin the model expects to be correct only 10 percent of the time and so the average accuracy should be quite low because the model uh, is expressing a very high uh, uncertainty whereas in this bin where the model expresses you know very high confidence you expect it to be like more accurate and if it's well calibrated you should expect the the predicted uh, confidence uh, to measure up with the actual estimate of the accuracy itself. So you can think of calibration as some sort of meta accuracy of sorts because it measures the alignment between the model's own confidence versus the accuracy. And uh, it, there are various aggregate metrics that you can um, 
measure uh, how far the model is from the ideal calibrated curve. But one common way that people do is they take each bucket and then you measure up the difference between the the, the expected versus the actual accuracy, and then you sum it up. And basically, um, that's what is called the expected calibration error. And um, it's important to note that uh, calibration is not always sufficient in the sense that that could be because what we really care about is the model to be as accurate as possible and also be as calibrated as possible. We want both of these criteria simultaneously. And so, uh, like a simple way a model can cheat by becoming perfectly calibrated is imagine your probability on the test set is like all classes are equal. Just like oh, if you take MNIST or CIFAR, all classes are equal. So the model can just always output, you know, like the uniform distribution for trivially for all inputs. And that if you do that, then all of the samples will end up in like this bucket here, like the 0.1 bucket, because the model just predicts with 0.1 confidence. And just because of the statistics of the data, it can be perfectly calibrated, but it wouldn't be very uh, accurate at all because it's just like a random predictor. So you, what we actually, we also care about something called refinement and uh, accuracy, and that's why when we look at calibration of models, it's also important to look at the accuracy of the underlying models, basically. And the there are a bunch of other metrics that uh, were commonly used, and a lot of the these metrics were actually evaluated, uh, uh, but actually that uh, uh, invented in the weather forecasting literature. So uh, because they use a lot of like forecasters, and there it's very important to assess the property of the probabilistic forecasters. So this is a very nice reference if you want to learn more uh, on proper scoring rules and uh, evaluation measures for uh, probabilistic forecast. And I'll just briefly mention two commonly used measures that people use. One is called the negative log likelihood, which is basically you take the confidence and the, the logarithm of the confidence. So uh, that uh, it, it is a proper scoring rule. Um, one um, implication is that it can sometimes overemphasize stale probabilities. Um, so it can be a bit sensitive to outliers. So that's something uh, to be aware of. The other popular metric that a lot of people use is what's called the Breyer score, which is a quadratic penalty, as you can see here, which is basically taking your probabilistic. So imagine you're doing classification problems. Um, you're do, if you have uh, a, like your probabilistic forecast, you just can measure the mean square error against your uh, one hot target, basically, and then use the average, which is called the Breyer score. And the nice property of this is that it is bounded. And uh, so the uh, the error on any one single data point is bounded in the 0, 1 range, whereas in log, the, the range can be quite broad, basically. And this can be useful. And Breyer score also has a couple of other nice properties. In particular, it turns out you can actually decompose this into calibration and refinement, um, which I mentioned in my previous slide. I'm not getting into the details, but you can find more details in the in this paper above. So um, the other property that we care about for uncertainty is uh, evaluating on order of distribution inputs. And uh, like an example of that is this uh, figure here, where imagine you're training a classifier on CIFAR 10. Um, which is a popular benchmark data set which contains images of like uh, uh, flights, uh, birds, cats, and so on. And um, what you can do is uh, intuitively, if your model, uh, if you ask this model uh, something which is not one of the existing classes, like for instance, the example on the right, which is images from the street view house numbers data set. So if you, if you show the classifier, uh, like a classifier train just on CIFAR 10, uh, if you show that, then it should uh, say, I don't know. Or uh, may, if, if it makes a prediction, it should be like with very low confidence that it's not one of the existing classes, basically. And uh, humans are great at this. So imagine you just speak like one language. If, I sh if, uh, if I'm shown like, um, like you know, uh, images from like a different language that I don't even understand, uh, I can still say, I don't know what it is, but I'm pretty sure it's not like an English character or something like that. Right, like so, um, uh, humans are great at this, and the, we want our models to also have this property that 
they can clearly predict none of the above or uh, say when examples don't belong to any of the existing classes and uh, some ways to measure this or basically taking like the model confidence for instance on the iid inputs and model confidence on what are called out of distribution inputs like od inputs like svh and above and you can look at like some sort of like summary statistics uh, like for instance how separable are the model confidences uh, like the max confidence the model assigns or the entropy of the p of y given x uh, that the model assigns for in distribution versus out of distribution and you can also do like summary metrics of these statistics like for instance uh, you can measure auc uh, which measures how separable these curves are and so on so um, i've talked a lot about like um, uh, i've talked a lot about uh, uh, the introducing um, uncertainty let me uh, spend a few minutes talking about some motivating applications um, because uh, it's very important to ground all the research we are doing in uh, on why it's like useful in the larger context of uh, science, right? Like so, um, like there's a lot of uh, applications of predictive uncertainty. So one theme you will see over and over in the stock uh, going forward is it's important to uh, know when to trust model predictions and especially on the I, uh, under data set shift, this is going to be a big problem. And uh, uncertainty is also useful for decision making. Um, and I'll show some applications like that. And it's important uh, for active learning was to use the uncertainty to get more data in regions where the, you don't have a lot of data. It will. It also comes up in uh, open set recognition, lifelong learning, and exploration. And I'll walk through some of these examples on the upcoming slides. So uh, one use case is uh, what's called natural distribution shift. So uh, we typically assume like the test comes from the same distribution as strain, but that assumption is violated a lot in like real life applications. And uh, this is an example uh, of like street view images, just uh, like natural variations. Um, you don't have to do any, uh, you know, anything special to induce this kind of like shift. This naturally emerges in a lot of the data. So you can imagine like over time, uh, the, the way the store, store fronts look change. So if you have been collecting, if, if you train a model based on like uh, 10 years old or something like that, there may be a natural shift in how the these images look. And similarly for countries, so imagine you have data in one country and you're training and you, you, you want to deploy the model to like, uh, like data from a different country or so on, then there will be some natural variations in the data. So you want the models to be like robust uh, to such type of like natural distribution. Shift. Another example is uh, this uh, that I mentioned before is open set recognition, which is the case that uh, the test input may not actually belong to one of the existing classes. So uh, th this, uh, like a really nice example of this is uh, this paper here where it's basically what we are trying to do is uh, predict bacterial species from uh, genomic sequences. And uh, what happens is uh, when you train the classifier, so imagine uh, you, you, at some point time, in some point in time, you take all the existing, uh, all the known bacterial species, and then you train your classifier, right? Like so. Uh, but we don't, the, your people have been discovering like a lot of, you know, like new bacterial classes that's denoted by the blue line uh, here. So uh, we don't know still like a lot of the, the classes that exist. So we can train a classifier only at any point in time. We can train a classifier on all the known classes. And if you deploy this classifier, what we see is um, it, it's, it can be, it can achieve high accuracy if the classifier belongs to one of the is the test input belongs to one of the known classes, but the but when we deploy it, since new bacteria are being discovered and there's a lot of things that do not belong to one of the existing classes, what can happen? We want the model to say the like a, if it encounters like an input at this time, uh, we want it to be reliably able to say it does not belong to one of the existing classes and not wrongly classify it as in distribution because that can have uh, you know. Uh, th th this type of misclassification can have a huge impact, basically. So we wanted to, uh, so this is the setting called uh, open set recognition where you don't know all the classes uh, 
at training time and at, you, you really need a classifier that can reject such OOD inputs in a reliable way. Um, and another similar example is conversational dialogue system. So uh, look at uh, this example on the right. Imagine you have like a chatbot which can only answer questions about, uh, like, you know, uh, it can only answer questions about your finance or something like that. And if you ask a different question, like, you know, something about like sports or something, uh, or then uh, if it answers something related to, because it can only answer such questions, if, if it says this, that, that can um, lead to a very frustrating like human experience, right? Like uh, we've all been there. And uh, it would be much more, uh, like a much more graceful way to fail is it can say something like, sorry, I can only answer questions about like this domain and uh, the whatever you're asking is out of scope in some sense. So um, another application where uh, uncertainty is very important is uh, medical imaging. So there's been lots of uh, papers on uh, using uncertainty from deep learning models to um, uh, improve uh, uh, uncertainty, basically. And I have image uh, like uh, have some images from these papers. Uh, check them out. Uh, one is related to like uh, diabetic retinopathy detection. The other one on eye uh, disease classification from OCT. Um, so here uh, the the, the model sometimes predicts, uh, makes a multi-class classifier and it predicts uh, how severe the condition is or like which cases need to be seen by a doctor and so on. And uh, in these cases, it's very important to have uncertainty because you, you have like asymmetric loss functions and uh, you may want to uh, take the model's uncertainty into account when uh, uh, knowing when to trust the model as well as uh, maybe if the model is unsure, we shouldn't, uh, you know, Trust the model's predictions, but um, you defer it to a human or something like that. And that could also be like uh, if there is su sufficient out of distribution inputs, like uh, uh, if the uh, if the image uh, is not taken properly or something like that, or if it's blurred or something like that, then the model should be able to reject it reliably, saying that this is. Uh, but uh, I mean, maybe the image is not centered or something like that. So the model should be able to reject so that the images uh, maybe like retake them or something like that. So uh, you can also have a lot of interesting use cases there. And um, uncertainty also comes up a lot in applications like Bayesian optimization and experimental design. So here uh, I have uh, on the right, I have this image showing uh, Bayesian optimization in action. So the, the way uh, we use uncertainty is to uh, decide the trade off between uh, so-called exploration versus exploitation. So uh, in experimental design and Bayesian optimization, we want to find the best set of hyperparameters. And uh, what we want to do is we, we, we want to minimize the number of experiments, but we also, uh, so we want to intelligently pick uh, the next point so that we uh, do a eff efficient search. And here, uh, if we don't want to, uh, if you have already evaluated one point, the model can pretty confidently assess um, the, the, you know, like the unobserved target at like nearby points, a much more reliable way. Whereas in points that are far away from uh, existing evals, then the model is more uncertain. So depending on um, the, you, here you care about doing an accurate prediction of like uh, the target, but also you need the uncertainty because you can use the uncertainty to uh, take better decisions and deciding trade off by uh, acquisition functions and uh, do more efficient search. So uh, I've talked a lot about like applications and uh, I wanted to point some concrete steps uh, to uh, highlight where current deep learning models fare uh, so that you can appreciate uh, that this is indeed a prob uh, problem that comes up a lot in the context of like deep learning methods. So um, I've talked a lot about like uh, uh, motivating applications, but uh, for a lot of research, we want like benchmark data sets where we can do large scale evaluations and, uh, you know, compare like different methods head to head and so on to understand which are the more promising methods and so on. Uh, one benchmark that has become quite popular uh, in this field is what's called ImageNet C, which uh, contains um, uh, like corrupted versions of ImageNet. So basically, in like typical benchmarks, we 
assume the uh, we use the IID set from the same distribution, and then we know that deep learning methods can do very well. Like I mentioned, it is one of like the success stories of uh, deep learning. And uh, but what happens if you violate the train test assumption? So how gracefully do these models uh, fail, and uh, how robust are they? And a way to measure this is to just take like some sort of like simple types of corruptions, like you know, like Gaussian noise or like you know, blurring and so on, and contrast and so on. So just take like simple types of corruptions, and then you can increase the intensity. So each of these ops you can apply with like you can increase the amount of blurring you do, so that you have some increasing data set shift, so that you have a knob to move move from IID to more and more progressively out of distribution. And then you can measure like how different methods uh, fail in some sense to see whether intuitively we expect the model to be like most accurate here and less accurate going forward. And we can kind of like benchmark um, how the models do. So it's, it, we did like uh, like a benchmark on like a lot of methods before uh, in our previous paper, basically uh, evaluating methods on the clean set and also measuring like how the how the model accuracies drop um, uh, as you increase the shift. And as expected, you do see the model accuracy to be dropping as you increase the shift. But the important thing from the perspective of uncertainty is that it's OK for the models to be wrong as long as you know their calibration or their own estimate of confidence actually reflects this accurately. And so we can measure the calibration. So here is a plot of the expected calibration error of different methods. Um, what you can see is, unfortunately, the calibration of the model also becomes quite worse as you as the shift increases. So, in a sense, what's happening is that the models are becoming more wrong, but their confidence does not really reflect that. So they are make they are uh, even when they are making mistakes, they are pretty confident, and this is a big problem basically uh, in deep learning. And uh, I'll go into the details of the methods later. But this just to showcase that this is uh, still an unsolved problem. And uh, the other problem also that I mentioned, which is um, deep nets can assign high confidence predictions to OOD inputs. So on the left uh, is an, like a image, images from like you know um, like a classic paper where they showed that uh, even though you show these images to like a classifier, it will uh, the state of the art DNNs will assign like very high confidence, like more than 99% confidence to these images, which are completely like you know you you'd be surprised that these are this assigning such high confidence predictions. And you can also construct really like simple 2D examples, like for instance like the binary classification problem that I'm showing here, where there are two classes shown in like blue and orange, and you have like OOD inputs, and if you look at the class boundaries, the models exhibit you know some sort of uh, uncertainty near the boundary, but there are still like pockets of um, inputs which are very far away from, relatively far away from the training data, where the model is very confident. You would expect the uncertainty to uh, the model to be more uncertain you know, as you move further away from the training data. So this is a desirable property um, that you might intuitively expect, but the models don't always uh, satisfy this property. So next, I'm going to hand it to Dustin. Uh, but before that, we can maybe um, have five minutes for questions. Yeah, it looks like there's some questions in the Q&A. Uh, OK. Yeah, Jasper, would you like to? Uh, um, um, I, I can relay some of these questions to you. I think uh, Jasper has been answering them. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, I've been kind of answering dynamically, but happy to address here as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you if point you to some have, code? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll have some code examples and pointers later in the presentation. And is that Gaussian noise? I'm not sure which part that was referring to. Uh, if you are asking about this picture, I think they were evolved. Uh, to have like very high confidence. Uh, yeah. Probably also on the question where you were adding um, noise to the um, images, I think a few slides earlier. This one, yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, um, I think this is probably short noise. If I, uh, yeah, it's not Gaussian noise, but 
Uh, also, Kwasi and I also look somewhat similar. Right? All right. OK. Oh, Are there uh, any other questions? Yeah. Please, if you have questions, ask them in the Q&A at the, at the bottom of uh, the Zoom app, or I think in the uh, app, yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, somebody asked, like, how do you define accuracy in a regression task? Uh, that's a good point. Like, uh, I'm mostly focusing on classification as the running example in this talk. Uh, but for regression, you could also do, um, you could define, if, if you have, like, a likelihood, you can imagine, like, you know, the model predicts, like, a mean and a variance or something. And then you could evaluate the log likelihood under this probabilistic distribution. And you can have measures like mean square error or mean absolute error and so on which are uh, measures of accuracy, how accurately the model recovers the uh, underlying function. And I mentioned like Briar score. Uh, it turns out you can also define um, some, um, like measures on CDFs. So once you convert to CDFs, it, it, you, you can basically reduce uh, everything to, you can reuse a lot of these measures basically because they are all functions on zero to one. And there is in particular a very nice measure called cumulative ranked probability score, which is measuring like difference in the actual CDF versus the model's predicted CDF. And that is uh, like, a, uh, it's very related to the Briar score that I presented. All right. Another uh, question, would adversarial examples be considered OOD? Logi, that's oh. your, your domain. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think of like adversarial examples as a worst case uh, out of distribution in some sense, and uh, they're uh, and any kind of like uh, we ultimately do want to also develop solutions that are robust to adversarial examples. Um, a lot of like focus uh, uh, right now is on um, you know it, it's kind of like. I think it's important to focus on the problem, um, but I also feel like the there are some the, the if the average case performance if the model does not even pass the simple checks that you would expect like CPAR10 versus SVHN, uh, it's going to be really hard to solve the adversarial worst case problem, right? Like so, I I, I think it's important to make uh, make progress on these other benchmarks as well be before uh, we start focusing on the worst case in some sense. But it's that's just my personal preference. If you're really passionate about that, you should absolutely work on that. Yeah. All right. OK. I'll hand it off to Dustin. Well, um, yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll take questions um, after my um, set. And I'm sure there'll be some, there'll be a little bit of time after the whole sequence of talks so that we can asynchronously answer questions. Um, so yeah, so I'll start by going into um, uh, sort of like the language and frameworks that we're using to sort of describe potential solutions to these problems. Um, you go to the next slide. Uh, and this starts from um, sort of taking out probabilistic approach to understanding how we um, uh, solve machine learning and uh, statistics style problems. Um, and the very high level overview of how this works is that um, if you're imagining like some formalization of what the scientific um, uh, process is, the scientific method is. Um, you start with having some domain knowledge, you formalize them, you, you start making assumptions given that um, with your domain knowledge, you, you, you bake them into an actual model. That model is something like a, you know, it describes a generative process or just it's just some function that takes inputs and returns outputs. Um, you uh, have data, that data comes from actually running experiments if you're in the 1700s or you have modern you know, um, Amazon Turk or something to, to get together the data, or you just um, scrape data from the web. Um, anything uh, can, can really count as data. Then given those two sort of things, those two inputs, you um, actually run an algorithm to um, sort of infer the hidden, hidden structure that's behind your model. So usually that's sort of like a, a set of parameters that, that governs the family of uh, distributions that you have in your model. Um, after running that algorithm, you're, able, you're finally able to make predictions and sort of explore, sort, sort of see um, what your, um, what your, your model can do um, uh, on arbitrary um, inputs and outputs. Um, and this high level overview is really important because um, this is um, sort of the foundation behind many fields that um, leverage data analysis. 
in his pipeline, uh, what's one, one thing that's particularly nice about it is that it sort of separates the assumptions that you're making, which is part of the model building procedure, the actual computation that goes into running the algorithms, and then the actual applications of leveraging these models. Um, can you go to the next slide? And so this um, process is not really just a serial three-step process. It's actually a loop in that just like um, the scientific method, it's all about um, get, taking your models and really checking if these are actually fitting the assumptions that you care about. So here, um, the, the formal name for this is called model criticism. Uh, but more, more broadly in machine learning, this is how you just evaluate methods. You, you have a leaderboard or, some, uh, or something of that sort. You, you check something like accuracy, you see how well that model fits the data, and then you, uh, on an unseen data, so you test that or something, and then you go back to revise your model. So you, you um, check specific assumptions, like maybe my, um, maybe the way that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, composing conv layers is not, a, not really uh, super indicative of anything. Um, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Ah, so, uh, so that was a high level overview and um, where um, probability machine learning particularly fits in is how it involves the language of probability theory in the individual steps of that process. So um, really you can think of, um, uh, you can think of a particular model under the probabilistic approach as sort of a joint distribution. Um, so here, this is all gonna be in discriminative land because we're talking mostly about supervised learning here. So um, we're gonna have an observe, we're gonna have a distribution over observed outputs, Y given X, and there's gonna be some parameters. Um, and the probabilistic model is gonna have a, it's gonna be a joint distribution of those outputs and those parameters. Um, and that's the, the model, so that's step one. Step two is about making inference about the unknown. So in this case, it's the parameters and the posterior, what we call the posterior is this conditional distribution of the parameters given your, actually, your um, observed data set. Um, and this is really, this is not like any, um, the philosophical um, statement or anything. This is just Bayes rule that I'm applying here. So this is the conditional distribution. You expand it out. You get a joint divided by this marginal distribution, and you can play around with distributions all you'd like. Um, and um, one of the central things with um, policy machine learning is that for most interesting models, this denominator here, this marginal likelihood, is not tractable um, because it's a high dimensional integral problem, integration problem, where theta here, the parameters, is probably millions to billions of dimensions. Um, so um, that's, the, that's the stage of how we're thinking about the modeling um, step one and then the inference step two. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Can you go to the next slide? Okay, yeah. Um, so, um, so that's really the recipe for um, the probability approach to um, uh, uh, machine learning and how you might try to get at something like uncertainty estimation or robustness. So here you're specifying the likelihood Typically, it's something like a neural net and some output distribution. So maybe it's a categorical likelihood, the Gaussian if you have out, uh, continuous outputs, uh, or something more complicated than those two. And you have a prior distribution over those parameters. Um, and given that model, you, step two is um, choosing some algorithm to actually perform approximate inference. And we'll go into um, a, a, in, in more depth on how you um, select these things. And then step three, how you actually make predictions and exploration. Um, there are multiple approaches. Um, the, um, the most generic one is to just do Monte Carlo estimation to sample from the um, distribution. So here, what we're looking at is um, the distribution of, an, of, of the outputs given an unseen input, so an arbitrary input X, conditional on your data set. And here, what we're doing is we're sampling from the posterior, so P of theta, and uh, we're doing a Monte Carlo estimate, so an average over each parameter set, each sample from the thetas, and uh, giving you the, um, the, the distribution of the outputs conditional on that set of parameters. Um, and we can, we, it, it, it's pretty easy to work out um, how, this, how this formula is direct. Um, but that's the, that's the general recipe. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, to connect this back to um, what people uh, are familiar with, if you're thinking about just like how do neural nets with SGE fit into this, um, you can think of this as, as sort of taking a point um, as a point estimate, like a, a specific set of your parameters to approximate that full posterior distribution. It's a very simple approach. It works well and it's a simple baseline for a lot of things that we're um, talking about. Um, and the way you might want to select that point is to choose the highest probability under that posterior distribution. So here's a very simple one slide sort of derivation for how you get neural nets with SGD. Um, you start from trying to take the maximum of your posteriors at P of theta given X and Y. You can uh, Equivalently, you're maximizing the log, log likelihood because log is a convex function. It preserves the mode. 
um, you can expand out the posterior. So this is um, taking the joint distribution, so log of the joint. And there is a constant, which is the marginal likelihood. Um, for reasons um, that may not be clear from the derivation, that is a constant with respect to theta because the marginal likelihood does not depend on the parameters that you're changing. Um, you can rewrite the max to a min. And uh, now we have the generic um, a soft mass, you get a generic cross entropy problem with some prior. And as a special case of this, if you're doing classification, and so your likelihood is categorical. And let's say you have some prior on your parameters, it could be something like L2. So this is technically a Gaussian prior with um, a particular standard deviation, which is given by lambda here. Um, and so that's, that's exactly the procedure here. Um, the special case uh, of, of this is it's sort of soft mass cross entropy with L2. And then with that specific algorithm to actually find the mode or the minima, uh, this is um, something like SGD. Um, so in the figure here, there's, there's, you know, this, there's a, it's a generic distribution. It's probably bimodal. So in this case, it has four different modes. And what um, SGD will do is it will try to find one of these modes. And then I'll use that to uh, make, make predictions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's a general setup, and uh, now we'll start to go into methods that are a little bit more complicated than just neural nets with SGD. Uh, next slide. Um, so the most natural one coming from just typical neural nets is to uh, think about if we were to use um, non-degenerate priors and non-degenerate posteriors. Um, so ones that actually have problem mass beyond a single point. Um, and the two ingredients here is to think about what that prior is, P of theta. Um, there are many different choices. Um, um, for how you might choose that P of theta. It's sort of shown by the figure here on the right. Um, so there's like, there, there, there's a lot of different behaviors that you might uh, want to consider from sparsity. So where, how, how peaky the, the distribution is at zero. Um, the tail behavior is how much quality mass is, is on the um, ends of the spectrum. So around three, um, three or higher or negative three or higher. Um, and then after specifying the prior, you have a family distribution you're gonna use to actually approximate that true posterior. Um, and uh, we'll go into how you select that. And um, after you're actually um, fitting, uh, you're, you're finding the uh, specific uh, uh, family, your specific distribution that uh, fits well to the posterior, you'll, you might have something like the bottom, um, the bottom figure here, where um, if you have a sufficient amount of data for uh, this sort of interval from like negative two to 1.5 or something, you'll fit the data pretty well, but then on un unobserved inputs that you've never seen, so like out of distribution inputs, anything beyond that sort of interval, um, your, um, your confidence sort of grows um, uh, under some behavior linearly exponentially or something. So the, so the uncertainty grows, predictive um, standard deviations grows um, as you try to extrapolate which is sort of the desired behavior you want for uncertainty estimation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, the first approach to um, trying to do um, uh, inference is with variational inference. Uh, variational inference is a fairly simple procedure. It, it just takes the way you do posterior inference as, um, and you cast it as sort of an optimization problem. So you have that family of distributions. Here is a parametric family. Um, and a common, a common choice is something like a mean field or a fully factorized distribution. So here there's Q of theta, it's parameterized by a set of um, parameters lambda. And here we're just factorizing it just that there's Q of theta i, theta i is like each um, weight element or uh, each um, uh, element in the bias terms. Um, and um, you typically might want to choose the variational distribution, each of these variational di distributions to be something like the prior. So if you're Gaussian prior, for example, uh, corresponding to L2, you might have a Gaussian uh, uh, variational distribution for each of these terms. And then given that family, you're going to optimize some loss function from a, a divergence measure with respect to those parameters lambda, and you're going to uh, optimize it such that it, it tries to be close to the procedure. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the caricature of um, how this figure works. You start with some initial parameters, um, for an iterative optimization procedure like gradient descent, so it's new in it, and then you you traverse some optimization trajectory, and you eventually get to something like new star here, where new star is closest in KL to P of Z given X, which is the true posterior. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the concrete loss function for how VI works. Um, the uh, the loss function is taking expectation of your log likelihood term with respect to your um, true posterior or your uh, approximate posterior Q theta. Um, and you have a KL term. Um, and um, 
uh, algorithmically how this works is that you might do something like sampling from Q to Monte Carlo estimate this expectation, similar to how you might Monte Carlo estimate the posterior predictive when you're doing test time predictions. And then you're gonna take gradient to your new backdrop through uh, like SGD. And most of the time it will work with like footnotes. Um, and um, uh, how might you interpret like what this sort of loss function is doing? Well, um, you can think of the negative of this loss function as a lower bound to the marginal likelihood. So this is known as the evidence lower bounds. It's sort of the, the likelihood interpretation where VI was actually first invented. It's, it's sort of like a, a very, it comes from the EM algorithm where you're taking the, the, the marginal likelihood which you want to maximize. So you're just doing something like MLE and um, you can drive a bound to this using an approximate posterior. And then you're, you're, you're trying to fit, best fit the approximate posterior. It's just that you can get a tighter and tighter bound on the true, uh, the true likelihood out here. And so this is a bound, this is, um, um, this is less than or equal for all parameters um, lambda, and um, if the true, uh, if the uh, variational posterior was um, exact, so it was um, equal to the true posterior, then this is um, this is an e this is an equal sign and not just uh, less than, like a strictly less than um, equality inequality. Um, there's also a code length view from this coming from um, the minimum description length perspective or the coding theory perspective which is that if you look at the first term here, what you're trying to do is minimize the number of bits you're using. Uh, so your, the flexibility you have is in choosing uh, lambda here. You're, you're minimizing the number of bits you're, that are required to explain the data. So every time um, you um, evaluate this, um, this log likelihood term, you're paying a certain amount of bits that are required to um, actually reconstruct the outputs given a certain inputs. Um, but as a trade-off, you don't want to pay too many bits because the second term here is the trade-off where if you move lambda too much, you might be deviating too much from the prior. So the KL penalty, the, 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 pay, the penalty you're paying for deviating from the prior is gonna be possibly too large. So those are the two uh, trade-offs that you wanna make um, from the uh, bit perspective. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so the first thing on, in terms of Bayesian neural nets of how you reselect the prior. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of details in, in how we do this and it, it is in fact still sort of an open challenge. Um, but uh, the standard one you might want to do is just a normal prior with uh, zero mean and unit standard deviation. That's sort of the default that everyone uses. Um, but it's not necessarily the best prior uh, to use. And there's many reasons behind why we don't really want to use um, standard normal priors in practice. Um, you, we can argue, we can look at this from sort of like the statistical perspective of like what the model looks like and what the the, uh, if you generate um, uh, draws from the model, what is it, what does that uh, model look like? Um, um, and it goes from like how we might leverage information within the network structure, what the asymptotic behavior looks like, and whether that's sort of the behavior that we uh, would be like, to um, you know how we actually um, select the prior. So if we have a specific domain knowledge, like if we want to encourage exploration, how we might do such the thing. Um, and you can go into actual, um, actually trainability properties. So if you're to actually use this prior. Um, uh, with SGD, um, uh, what, it, uh, what sort of behavior does that cause SGD to, like what sort of inductive biases does that have on SGD? And this ranges from the parameterization. So like um, uh, standard normal priors are not invariant to parameterization. So if you just change the way you um, parameterize your neural net, that can lead to very different um, uh, uh, end behaviors when you um, optimize to get your uh, end solutions. And in fact, it's also just too strong a regularizer, uh, particularly during early stages of training. So um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you've ever tried um, training Bayesian neural nets in practice, what often happens is that um, uh, if you look at the gradient, um, the gradient signals magnitude for the KL penalty, that, that is often much higher than um, what's required to fit the data. So the uh, expected log likelihood term. So often what will happen is that you'll just collapse and you'll have the majority of your um, uh, proximate posterior distribution just be, end up uh, being equal to the prior. So you won't really be fitting the data at all. Um, and there's a lot of recent work that have been improving this, um, uh, improving how we select the prior coming from uh, thinking about priors in the uh, function space, thinking about uh, exactly how um, inputs and outputs might operate with uh, a distribution over this non-parametric space. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, second step was um, thinking about how we might select the approximate posterior. Um, this is sort of a, um, you know, a question that has been longstanding. It's, it's been a question since we even fit, started to fit probabilistic models to neural nets back in the uh, late 80s. Um, 
And um, as I was mentioning, the, common, the most common one coming from the late 80s was, in fact, this mean field approach, fully factorized, where you might have a, um, a Gaussian uh, per element of your weight matrix and bias, uh, bias terms. Um, but there, there's many different choices, like you can do mixtures of, uh, uh, of uh, mean field distributions, you can do structured factorizations, there's also hierarchical versions of these things. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies in the literature and many individual publications are all about choosing like what is a better um, approximate procedure that works well with PI. Next slide, please. So as an alternative to approximate inference with VI, you can also do something with Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo, where instead of having a parametric family distributions Q um, that you're optimizing and, and uh, finding the set of, uh, you know, the uh, set of parameters in that family that best represents the posterior, you can just do a non-parametric thing where you're sort of just doing um, more of a, a random walk behind um, the, you're sort of exploring within the true posterior and you're collecting samples as you explore in that space. So uh, here, if you're just looking at what the test time behavior it is with a, uh, when you're making predictions, you're, you're just using a bunch of different samples. So you're using S different samples from theta. And uh, MCMC is sort of a way of how you might draw those samples. And the way it works is by taking uh, what's called the posterior energy, but um, in, in the previous talks, sort of, in the previous slides, this was sort of uh, just the joint distribution, the negative joint distribution, uh, a joint density where um, your first term here is a likelihood. So it sums over um, each data point and you have your prior. And uh, MCMC is just of many different strategies for how you might um, carefully walk leveraging this energy function to better explore the full posterior and give you those samples. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, MCMC for neural nets is also a very classic thing. It's, it's, uh, it, uh, I think it, it sort of became the um, standard for how you might do um, Bayesian neural nets and probabilistic modeling with neural nets um, in the 90s. It was in fact um, sort of uh, uh, winning on um, a lot of high profile competitions back in the day. Um, and the, um, a lot of the um, ideas come classically from statistical physics. Uh, they leverage um, Hamiltonian dynamics or Langevin dynamics to uh, give you ways to um, uh, take a specific sample and move along, uh, move in the space while preserving um, certain behaviors that you care about with MCMC. Uh, and there's, and, and um, leveraging a lot of these ideas, um, uh, it used to be the case that MCMC for um, deep learning really didn't work because um, MCMC wasn't as amenable as VI with stochastic optimization. Uh, but it, but in recent um, uh, but in recent literature within the past year or so, um, there have been a lot of interesting um, uh, works that have gotten pretty good results with MCMC. Um, but as a caveat here, um, MCMC is not sort of the perfect solution. There are many tricks that are required to get it to work. Um, and there's a lot of, um, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of impracticality with how you um, leverage these things because um, the procedure tends to be fairly expensive compared to SGD. Um, so in uh, one of the works, um, it, it sort of takes a thousand different epics of training uh, for something like CIFAR, as opposed to maybe like 200 for deterministic training. And you have to carry thousands of copies of ResNet uh, of your um, architecture to uh, uh, make uh, good predictions. Um, and uh, the next slide will be about um, sort of be like about simpler baselines as sort of like a step back from this sort of higher, uh, very complex strategy of, of how you um, pick different things in the recipe. But before, the, before I hand that out um, to uh, Jasper, um, uh, maybe I can sort of just take questions um, and start answering those. Dustin, one of the questions was, um, can you please provide links slash pointers for learning the topic? And that came up when you were talking about priors and posteriors. Yeah, um, for that. that's, that's a great question. I don't think there is a good canonical link or a, a canonical paper for selecting priors. Um, I think the Neil 1994 um, paper and, and uh, when we share the PDF for this, um, you can get the actual um, paper from it. I think if you search like Radford Neal priors for infinite neural nets or something like that, it goes into a bit more depth of um, sort of the asymptotic perspective of if you were to take a neural net and um, go the infinite width. Um, I think um, you could also go into just the um, sort of first paper with neural nets in uh, uh, backprop and um, VI in recent literature. So that would be um, uh, uh, Blundell 2015. 
uh, it's sort of an ICML reviewer that's pretty good at um, describing some of this. And there's a, there's a slew of a lot of recent literature. So in those cases, um, uh, once uh, the PDF is available, you can definitely check out um, a lot of the uh, more recent papers that study priors. Also some early work by David Mackay is, is really great, um, kind of setting the, the standard for thinking about these things. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jasper, would it make sense to use the prior which resembles the distribution that we were trying to model? And in that case, how can we get the underlying distribution? Aha, that's a, a really great question. That's like a, a, something I think about quite a bit, um, which is like, yes, if you know what the structure of the problem is, so maybe like the form of the function you're trying to regress, then ideally you would specify a prior that takes advantage of that. With deep neural nets, that's harder, particularly with structured inputs, right? We, we do certainly capture something like that with data augmentation, for example, where we're saying effectively, we're imposing a prior by saying um, our model should output effectively the same thing for slight rotations of an image or something. But in neural nets, it's really hard to specify a prior on the form of the function it's kind of implicit in the architecture and the initialization and lots of stuff around it. I'm gonna talk about Gaussian processes in a second. And there, I think it's very, it's very clear and neat how you specify a prior over functions. But in neural nets, we typically kind of just say, uh, we give up and we think the prior is, the weight should be small. So zero mean Gaussian, even though we know that that's probably not a great prior. Uh, the next question is, can you explain a little bit more on Hamiltonian MCMC? Um, uh, I think the, uh, the best way to describe this is that um, without going too much into sort of the equations of it, um, you're leveraging Hamilton dynamics to sort of preserve um, um, some properties of the specific sample that you're, you're, you're using. There's, um, there's particular ways of, of, of leveraging um, uh, something known as sort of like the, the leapfrog integrator to actually um, propose the next step that you're doing. Um, there's a lot of sort of complications how like leveraging SDEs to sample um, to get new points um, works with this sort of um, uh, 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 front by transitioning from that point. Um, there's a lot of like, th for example, there's like discretization behavior that's that there's sort of discretization that you have to do and that sort of causes inaccuracies. So the ultimate um, procedure that you might do with um, uh, leveraging um, these sort of uh, uh, different equations is to use it within a metropolis Hastings procedure, where you're actually proposing and then you're you're checking if that um, if that falls under a particular ratio and you're accepting or you're rejecting that sample and you're continuing and so on and so forth. I think there could be um, an entire lecture on just MCMC. Um, so I think if you definitely want to learn more about um, uh, MCMC and, you're in, and in particular if you're interested in that sort of research. I would recommend um, Ian's um, Ian's survey about this. Uh, next question is: How would you select? How would you pick your prior if your data has multiple different distributions in it? Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by multiple different distributions. If you have a data set, um, there is sort of like one distribution which it has, but it might have something like multimodal behavior, or you're, you might be thinking about um, the extrapolation behavior where the training set that you're using is very different from your test set. Um, and I think a lot of, I think that's a great question because that sort of point that, that alludes to why just using um, a standard normal prior over each weight element is sort of a bad idea because it doesn't give you any way to actually like use what you're thinking about. Like if, if, you, if, you, have a, if you have a better sense of like if the distribution is multimodal or um, if my, um, if my uh, distribution that I'm trying to make predictions on is like um, actually within the distribution, but it concentrates more on a certain area. Um, those things are, are better encapsulated through um, functional priors. Um, and um, you can think of these as, um, uh, I, think, I think the best answer in terms of how you might think of functional priors is um, something that Jasper also talked about um, when he goes into uh, guessing processes. Uh, next question is, what are your thoughts on UQ methods based on gradient perturbation? Um, I'm not sure what particular um, 
method you're talking about, um, there are adversarial methods that use gradient perturbations to be robust to certain examples. Um, those, and those are evaluated on adversarial examples, which are a form of OD. Um, they don't work as well on in expectation. So they, they might solve um, the sort of worst case behavior when you're looking at sort of an epsilon ball around your certain the inputs that you're testing. Um, but if you evaluate on, if you look at like how they perform on standard um, leaderboards on um, uh, a corrupted version of CIFAR or ImageNet or, uh, or um, uh, a, natural, a more natural version where you, you just run, you take the ImageNet data gathering process, you just run that process again, get a new data set. Um, those behaviors don't, don't work super well. Uh, but I think they are super exciting in the case where we do care about the worst case um, behavior. Stochastic gradient um, Langevin dynamics or stochastic gradient MCMC can be thought of as like gradient perturbation in a way, right? Where right. there you just do stochastic gradient descent, but you add a little bit of noise to the gradients at every step. And that has the effect to like kind of perform this random walk trajectory. Um, so that is, that is one way to, to get like a, a sample from the posterior through gradient perturbation. Uh, my thoughts on that are, I like wish, I really wish it worked and I've tried really hard to get it to work, but it's really hard to make that work and it takes a tremendous amount of samples and it makes time to say. Cool. Yeah, and, and now I'll hand, hand it off to Jasper. All right, just give me one sec. I've got one laptop with where I can install Zoom, but it has a bad mic, and then another laptop that has a good mic, but I can't install Zoom. Um, but you can all hear me OK? Somebody indicate yes? Yes, very good. Okay. Um, Balaji, can you click the next slide? Okay, so um, Dustin talked about most of the, the rigorous methods, and I get the, the honor of talking about somewhat more, more heuristic things. So um, we'll start out with recalibration. Um, and so a really simple idea for getting better uncertainty, you might imagine, is just like um, explicitly recalibrate the model. And one way you can do this is something called temperature scaling, which is basically you, you take a held out validation set or a, an out of distribution set, and you rescale the temperature of the output distribution. So you basically like either smooth out the output probabilities or sharpen them to, uh, to match the, that validation set more. Um, and that's something called temperature scaling. And uh, you can see it's just optimizing this one temperature parameter on the softmax. Um, and it tends to work quite well on the in distribution data. We've actually found empirically that it doesn't do very well on out of distribution data. So you don't get this epistemic uncertainty or data uncertainty, but you do kind of get the aleatoric uncertainty from that. Um, but it's a strong baseline and it makes sense to do it. Next slide. Okay, then another strategy uh, that's been very popular is um, Yaron Gal and Zubin Garamani had this paper where they proposed effectively kind of approximating an ensemble through, through dropout. So if you're familiar with dropout, right, it's a regularization technique where you um, stochastically drop out hidden units uh, during training. And the innovation here is to keep this stochastic, uh, these stochastic units at test time and average over the predictions. So you basically drop out units when you're predicting and then average over the predictions. And that gives you at least better uncertainty than, uh, than not doing anything. Um, and is also a pretty competitive baseline. Next slide. Okay, so the, the next thing is deep ensembles. And so uh, here the idea is basically just rerun standard stochastic gradient training uh, or whatever um, optimization method you, you like, 
but with different different random seeds, and then average the predictions of the of the different models you end up with. Um, and so this is kind of a really well known trick for getting better accuracy. It's super super common on Kaggle. The top scoring teams on Kaggle always ensemble like a whole bunch of different methods. In my view, it's pretty unsatisfying because we're relying on the fact that the loss landscape is non-convex. Um, and even though we're using a convex optimizer, it takes us into different modes. And, uh, and this gives us kind of qualitatively different models. And then by pure chance, these are diverse and we get um, a nice diverse set of predictions. Balaji, uh, along with his co-authors, uh, tried this out. So they tried a whole bunch of things and were surprised at how effective ensembles were. Um, and I have a fantastic paper kind of talking about why this is the case um, in that simple and scalable predictive uncertainty estimation paper. Next slide. So uh, Balaji showed you this picture uh, above earlier talking about how accuracy degrades, but then if you look at calibration, so these are, are corruptions on ImageNet. Um, looking at calibration, it also gets worse. And that's from a benchmark paper we ran a, a year or so ago. And, uh, and there, the kind of the shining thing that, that did really well, or maybe I should say didn't do quite as badly um, in terms of calibration was ensembles. Um, they kind of outperformed all of the, the approximate Bayesian things we did and this temperature scaling stuff that I told you about just now. All right, next slide. So why do these work well in practice? Um, oh, Balaji, is this a slide where the animation is gone? Uh, yes, unfortunately, I converted to PDF and oh. I think I dropped the animation. <laughs> yeah. I would ask you to imagine a beautiful animation <laughs> where, where it says space of solutions, but maybe I'll try to, to describe what it is. So um, you might ask, why do deep ensembles seem to do better than, than these very rigorous things like variational inference or, or Mont, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo that Dustin talked about? And the, one of the reasons is that these approximate Bayesian methods in general tend to kind of um, start in a random place and then find a mode and then locally explore that mode. So you could imagine like a bunch of different basins or bowls next to each other. And these methods kind of go into one basin and then locally approximate that. And ensembles kind of start in different places and end up in different basins. And it turns out that getting into these different basins is, seems to be really important. Um, to get a diverse set of predictions. And so that's actually a really interesting observation that, um, that was really brought out in this paper called uh, Deep Ensembles, a Lost Landscape Perspective by Stanford and, and, uh, and Balaji as well. Um, so in the right panel there, imagine a beautiful figure with multiple basins, multiple optima, and variational inference getting into one mode and kind of moving around, whereas ensembles kind of get into the different basins. Next slide, please. Okay, so ensembles seem to work really well. Um, you might ask kind of like, why not just do ensembling all the time? And unfortunately, ensembling means you have to carry around a bunch of copies of the same model which for some purposes is totally fine. Um, you know, for our purposes, it, where we like want to serve a giant model at very high throughput, then you might imagine that's undesirable, right? You need to do a forward pass through each model. And typically we found that we try to get the biggest neural nets we possibly can fit into, into memory. Um, and that makes it impossible to, to carry around multiple copies. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, and Bayesian neural nets also seem to, to be very promising, but uh, MCMC, for example, you need to carry around many samples as well. So you also have to carry around all these different models. Um, and so uh, Balaji and Dustin and I have spent uh, a considerable amount of effort 
um, thinking about how do we kind of approximate these these approaches in in cheaper ways, um, along with uh, other fantastic researchers in the community, uh, such as Aaron, uh, Andrew Gordon Wilson and uh, Aaron Gal, and more. Next slide, please. Okay, right, so one of the things that um, that actually Dustin and collaborators Ethan Wen uh, et al came up with was um, what if we take a standard neural network and we say that each layer has a rank one factor that gets multiplied multiplied by another rank one factor um, that then forms the size of the weight matrix and then multiplicatively multiplied by the weight matrix. Um, and so you can imagine that this is kind of modulating the weights of the of the single neural net, such that if you have multiple of these rank one factors, then you can have multiple effectively different paths through the network from the bottom to the top. And then averaging over a bunch of these random vectors multiplied by the network kind of gives you an implicit ensemble um, that you can then compute in, in a really efficient way just using batching. Next slide. So we took this, this idea further and said, well, can we come up with a Bayesian interpretation of this? And, um, and actually placed a, a um, variational posterior on these rank one factors. So we place a, a distribution on the rank one factors, and then we optimize them via the elbow that Dustin told you about. And there, then, the product is you have this model with a distribution over rank one factors. And you can sample rank one factors that then modulate each layer of the network and kind of modulate the, the path through which uh, the data goes from the bottom to the top. And averaging over a bunch of these sampled uh, implicit ensemble members then gives you uh, a, a diverse um, posterior over predictions. Um, one way to get even closer to ensembles is to say you have a mixture distribution over these rank one factors. So you sample a rank one factor from a mixture of rank one factors, and you could imagine each mixture kind of corresponding to an ensemble member. Um, and so we found empirically that this performs really well and actually gives better calibration than even uh, a standard ensemble on a bunch of problems uh, while incurring only a slight addition like a tiny addition in, the, in terms of extra parameters. Next slide. OK, then the, the last method I'll tell you about is maybe the one I'm most passionate about, but also probably the most complicated. Um, so there, there is a particular instance in which we can actually compute the marginal likelihood, so this integral that Dustin told you about as well, analytically, and not have to approximate it. And that arises if we assume that there's a Gaussian distribution on the likelihood, a Gaussian distribution on the prior, then multiplying two Gaussians gives a Gaussian, and an integral over a Gaussian gives another Gaussian. So um, we can do everything in closed form and compute this integral, and it just gives you a big Gaussian. Um, in the limit of infinite basis functions, you, um, you actually arise at this covariance which is the covariance of the ultimate Gaussian that you end up with. Um, and we call this a, a Gaussian process. Um, I know that's a lot to take in, but uh, this book by Rasmussen and Williams is, uh, I view as seminal literature on the subject, was my favorite book in, in grad school. Definitely recommend you read it. Um, so what you end up with is a, a flexible distribution over functions this giant Gaussian. Um, it's specified now by a covariance function over examples. So if you're familiar with the kernel trick, then that's exactly what's happening here. Um, the kernel becomes the covariance matrix of this big Gaussian, effectively. And the parameters disappear entirely because we've integrated them out. Um, and then if we condition on data, we get a nice posterior on functions. So on the right there, you can see samples from a, a Gaussian process prior. Um, so sampled functions, and then condition on data, you get a, a posterior over functions. 
Next slide. A little more formally, so Gaussian processes are distributions over functions from some space to the real numbers. You can say that the observations of any set of points are jointly Gaussian. Here's what I found on the web. That was interesting. Google uh, Assistant just answered a question that I didn't ask for some reason. Um, okay, so they are specified by a mean function and a covariance. The covariance is that, that kernel that I told you about. And um, we can compute effectively everything that we want analytically. So the predictive mean and covariance given observations is this equation here, this mu, um, which involves, unfortunately, inverting this kernel, this covariance matrix. Um, and then the variance of predictions is below, which also involves the covariance between test examples and the training set um, and the covariance between all training examples. So you might look at this and say, oh, I have to compute a covariance matrix over my training data, which is right, which is n, uh, n squared in size. And then I have to invert it, which is cubic in the number of operations. So uh, GPs are typically only used in very, um, very low data regimes. They're kind of seen as the, the state of the art or the gold standard in getting good uncertainty estimates, especially for regression. But because of this scaling issue, they're, they're kind of limited to smaller problems. Um, intuitively, there are prior for smooth functions. Um, similar outputs should have, similar inputs should have similar outputs. And, uh, and we can compute all the quantities that we want uh, easily analytically. Next slide. OK, so you might wonder, why are you telling me about Gaussian processes? This is, about, this is a deep neural nets lecture. And the reason is that um, in the limit of infinite width, and you assume a Gaussian prior, um, then integrating over your parameters, which gives you good uncertainty and is kind of the Bayesian thing to do, converges to a Gaussian process. Um, so this is a seminal result that, again, came from Radford Neal's PhD thesis, which is kind of this amazing tome of literature that he produced. Uh, the, you, can, you can kind of think of it as saying that the covariance matrix, the kernel, is basically just a covariance taken over the hidden layer activations. So you just take the inner product, basically, of the hidden layer activations, and that gives you the distance or the similarity between two examples. Um, <clears throat> the caveat, and maybe the hard part to understand, is that uh, you have to marginalize you have to take the, sorry, the hidden units to the limit of infinite different hidden units for it to really work out. Okay, so then uh, to give a little history, Chris Williams came up with, uh, with an actual covariance function for a particular kind of neural net in, in 97. And then very recently, there's been a lot of renewed interest um, from the deep neural net literature. Uh, and so there's a couple of citations here, but there's been a, a bunch of fantastic work establishing the connection between GPs and, and deep neural networks at the infinite limit, and coming up with the GP equivalent of interesting architectures like convolutional networks and so on. Um, uh, along with Ben Adlam, I submitted a paper to NERPS where we looked at the how good the uncertainty was of these particular Gaussian processes, and it turns out it's pretty fantastic. Um, they're quite well calibrated, so doing the Bayesian thing, the right thing, is 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 actually paying off there. Um, and I, I'd love to point you to uh, a fantastic library called Neural Tangents, which was uh, put together by some colleagues at, at Google. If you want to play play around with this, next slide, please. Mustafa, how am I doing on time? Uh, we have uh, six minutes left, but I, it's fine oh, if we go a little bit over time. I, I think it's completely OK. Fine. Well, I will skim over this, but I will just give you an overview. Um, OK, next slide. OK, so um, this uh, essentially one way to get good calibration is to uh, come up with kind of implicit priors or uh, inductive biases 
that uh, that you expect would be kind of out of distribution data that you would see. And so data augmentation is a good way to do that. And that's something we've been, we've been exploring and tends to help calibration significantly. Next slide. Another thing we're really interested in is um, trying to come up with a drop-in replacement for standard neural networks. So instead of having to like follow this complex machinery or carry around an expensive model, wouldn't it be nice if you could just take your existing model, augment it in some way, and then have good uncertainty? And one way of doing that is, is to slice off the top and stick a Gaussian process on. Um, and there's, there's certainly some some kind of complexities to how to make that work well. Um, but that's something we're really excited about and, and seems to work quite well in practice. Next slide. And then uh, ensembles, you could imagine you could go a lot further than just um, doing random initializations. You could actually impose diversity on the ensemble through a regularization, for example or impose diversity on hyperparameters of the ensemble or have ensembles of models with complementary hyperparameters. And uh, these are also a couple of things that, uh, that we've been focusing on kind of quite recently in, in recent submissions to conferences. Next slide. OK, and then we'll, oh, so one quick pointer. I know somebody asked, is there code that we could point to? Um, where they could try running, uh, for example, CIFAR 10 versus SVHN? And the answer is yes, uh, there is. We are in the, within our team at Google, we are open sourcing as much as we possibly can. So there's some great code uh, to specify models and run them in Edward 2. Then uh, a, a code base that we just open sourced called Uncertainty Baselines, which contains a lot of uh, of pre-made models effectively to, uh, to run across, including a bunch of benchmarks. So that image at C that we talked about and a whole bunch of others. If you want to like try a new model and run it across a bunch of uncertainty be benchmarks, then, then you can do that using that code base. And then uh, uncertainty metrics, another um, code library that we just open sourced, which um, contains kind of canonical implementations of things like Briar score and, um, and ECE so that everyone can kind of share the same implementation of metrics. Next slide. All right, and then we'll, we'll finish off with, uh, with some open challenges, things that, that we're thinking about. Um, so one is uh, thinking about, you know, why, why does the Bayesian method or approximate Bayesian methods don't seem to be used in practice that often without some amount of kind of heuristics or hackery to get them to work. And so um, Florian Wenzel, uh, Sebastian Dozen, and a bunch of others and I um, put this paper up on online exploring why that's the case. So why does the Bayesian approach seem to not always outperform the non-Bayesian approach? And there's some, I think some really interesting kind of technical challenges we need to get past to answer that. Uh, what are good priors? So Dustin talked about that. What's the role of the choice of architecture, hyperparameters, heuristics like batch norm? Are they Bayesian? Are they not Bayesian? Um, do they give better uncertainty or not? How do we efficiently marginalize over high di dimensional neural net posteriors? So better approximations, certainly a, a, a strong research area right now. Um, getting a better understanding of OOD behavior. And um, and formulating kind of a more rigorous Bayesian interpretation of deep ensembles. So Balaji actually has a, a paper um, that is, I think, on archive now that, um, that really tries to pin down this question. And then we need better benchmarks. So we need realistic benchmarks that reflect real world challenges, which maybe some of you have immediately have ideas where, you know, if you get better uncertainty on, on your problem, which is like a real scientific problem, then uh, it's it would be really meaningful, and it would be really useful, I think, for the for the community to develop across those those benchmarks. All right, next slide. Oh yeah, we'll just skim through these. So we've we've appended a bunch of references at the end of the talk for uh, for you to to look at, 
And yeah, I'm also adding more as we speak. So we'll send like a new version of the slides after uh, uh, later today. Yeah. Okay. Great. We we have a lot of references in the intermediate slides when we present this stuff as well. We'll uh, add them back here as well so that you can find them all in one place. And with that, I think we can take some questions. Maybe I'll, sorry, I need to jump between computers to, to be able to see the questions. Yeah, I can, I can echo I, them, I guess. Yeah, I can read. Yeah, OK. OK, go ahead, Justin. Uh, Jasper, the first one for you. How, can, how do we interpret infinite with neural nets? Do they have an infinite number of parameters? Uh, yes, they they effectively do. So the it's if you're familiar with the kernel trick, then then you probably wouldn't be asking this question. So maybe that's not the the right way to answer it. But um, the effectively they have infinite number of, of parameters, and the way that it works is you can actually compute the integral. So what you want is the covariance between examples over the, the last layer of neural nets, for example. And so what you do is you say, I have theta of x um, times theta of x prime, uh, the inner product of those two. And that will give me the covariance between these two examples at the end of the neural net. And then if I compute an integral over that from negative infinity to infinity, effectively, um, marginalizing over all possible weights, then I can actually compute that integral, the integral over that inner product um, analytically, which is exactly the construction that happens um, for most of the, the kernels in SVM and, and most of the covariance functions or kernels in Gaussian processes. Um, it's, it's clearly like it's, it's a pretty nuanced thing and super elegant once once it kind of like clicks but it might take more than uh, than a few minutes to explain in in uh, in all its glory so uh, next question is what will be the selection strategy for approximate inference approaches among mcmc vb and ensembles um, i maybe i can just take that one um, so um, i think the best way to um, sort of choose could be sort of if you just look at um, Actually, I think this is this is done pretty well in terms of the leaderboards that we have in their open source code. Um, ultimately, what matters isn't really the like algorithmic approach, but things like compute. So how much compute you have, what sort of assumptions that you're making with the model, um, what, what sort of assumptions can you like can you better impose in your model. Um, so um, given those things, you can sort of just choose the the, the top one. Um, but of course, if you're doing if you're doing research like methodological research. You can always just sort of choose your favorite one, see if you can advance it a little bit more. Uh, next question is for you, Jasper. Do GPs work well in modeling temporal data that is irregularly sampled? Good question. So um, I, would, I would say yes, but with a caveat. So Gaussian processes, I think a, a previous question kind of alluded to this, right? So like, how do you specify a prior over the over like the function that you care about and Gaussian processes give you a really nice toolkit to do that effectively um, you can basically say like here is kind of the model of uh, of the space that I want to of the kind of functions that I might imagine seeing um, and in GPs we do that by specifying a kernel function that's like maybe I think it's twice differentiable and really smooth or maybe I think it's periodic and there's a covariance function for that. Um, you might also specify like, okay, I think it's a step function and you can compute a kernel, which is like the inner product of infinite step functions. Um, and so you can kind of really carefully specify what your model is using a GP. And so it may be like, I think it's a dynamical system with uh, that is irregular, irre not regularly sampled, and um, and you can carefully specify that model. So um, I would say, like, 
if I was modeling that data, I would use a DP and not a neural net, probably, unless it's a, a large data set. Um, but I would very carefully uh, specify the model um, and think about it carefully before trying to apply like a standard GP with a standard kernel. Um, I'm not sure how much additional time we have, but th the next question is, is for Bosch. Maybe we could end there or, or figure it out. Um, but the, the last question is um, about uh, uh, why deep ensembles are not popular in deep data models and should they be? So that's a great question. Um, so there has been some work on like using like Bayesian inference for generative models as well as like ensembling uh, generative models. Uh, I, I think the methodology you can definitely do like integrating over parameters is a quite general principle and uh, you can do that. Um, uh, there's a parallel literature which we didn't actually go, there's a lot of things that we didn't go into this talk. And one of the things is the role of like generative models and out of distribution and uh, detecting OD inputs and so on. So I, uh, the short answer is the initial experiments, we found some surprising results uh, in making these ideas work. And, uh, but now we have been making some progress and um, I'll, I'll add some references. I, I, I'll share the slide deck in the Zoom Q&A, uh, summarizing some of our works uh, 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 earlier this year. But we also have some recent work that also has been trying to get to the bottom of this phenomenon. So uh, maybe that could be useful for folks. Yeah. And uh, if we didn't answer your question, please ask it on Slack channel or feel free to email us as well. Oh, there is, yeah. Maybe one last question that I think actually is interesting. Uh, in the infinite limit of training, the model UQ would be reduced. It would the model UQ be reduced? That's a, a, a great and, and I think very loaded question. Um, so, you know, I guess the in the theory on, on stochastic gradient descent, it says that if you have kind of an infinitely small learning rate or an in, infinitesimal learning rate and you run forever, you will converge to an optimum. And I think the answer is yes. At that point, you will, um, will probably have better, a worse uncertainty. Um, there's, you know, there, there's a bunch of work studying things like early stopping. So um, if you hold out a validation set and you're training and you watch the training curve get better, but you watch the validation error get worse, then early stopping says stop right before the validation error gets worse. And it turns out that that generalizes much better than like training to an optimum. So that's maybe one example of where that's true. Um, beyond that, I guess, certainly all of the MCMC literature would suggest that um, you should maybe keep training forever, but add noise to your, to your model. So it's um, following a Markov chain through the, the um, loss manifold or the posterior effectively. Does that seem reasonable, Dustin? Do you have stuff to add? Yeah, yeah I totally agree with that. OK. I think uh, we had uh, so many questions. And uh, th yeah, this was a great lecture. Thank you again, Boaji, Dustin, and Jasper. Um, I Certainly, there's also a lot of material to check after the lecture. And uh, we look at the code and also look at some of these seminal papers. Um, so thank you again for, for putting all this effort and preparing this great material and great lecture. And uh, thank thanks for everyone. Me. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everyone for uh, joining um, uh, today's lecture. And if you have more questions, please feel free to ask them on the Slack channel relevant to this uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I think Balaji is already there.
So if you have questions, I think at least Balaji will be able to answer and maybe Jasper and Dustin uh, can chime in at some point. Um, hopefully the, the slides are up on the website and um, I'll update the slides once Balaji has the links uh, for more material. Okay, thanks again and we'll see you at next week's lecture. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you.